Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He has over 40 years of experience advising high net worth clients in the investment industry. He also is a big investor in a regional bank, so I'd like his insights about the banking industry. We got them last time he was on for an interview. He's also a chartered financial analyst and a CFP, managing partner and founder of Oxbow Advisors. Ted Oakley, thank you for joining me again. Yeah, Jason, good to see you or hear you. <laughs> yeah, we're just doing audio only for today. We're recording this interview on Monday, October 16th, 2023. Ted, I want to ask you about your book that you put out in 2016 called Wall Street Lies, Five Myths to Keep Your Cash in, in Their Game. What do you think are the biggest lies right now lately from Wall Street in D.C.? And it seems there's a lot of them, some really big whopping fishtails. Well, I think, Jason, uh, it's, it's uh, multifaceted. If I just take the security side, let's just take stocks and bonds. Uh, one of the things I find is that, uh, one, and this has always been the case from the time that I, I started on Wall Street, uh, in the and so I know I know about it and was was there a few years before I came back to Dallas. But I had a, but one of the things I found was that it's always optimistic. There's nothing, they're never going to tell you realistically what's happening because uh, that wouldn't sell. In other words, if everything's designed to keep you in stocks all the time, you know, and there's certain times when you really should be light on the stocks and, you know, heavier on the cash. And I've seen over the years, I've seen a number. I mean, I, I could name seven or eight probably if I went back and tried a strategist that decided that, Hey, now it's not the time to be fully invested. They got fired, you know, because it was strictly sell side and you had to go party line because if you go differently, and you'll notice um, once in a while you'll have a strategy just come out and, and get negative on the market. And before long, within nine months or a year, you'll see them start drifting back into the middle because they're going to lose their job otherwise. And same way for their analysts, same way for uh, people that run the funds. It's all the same. That's one thing. Uh, the second thing is, is that, you know, most of the time they don't realize, people don't realize when you're dealing with these Wall Street firms and you're dealing with their bond desks, for example, you're only going to see their bonds. You know, if you want to go buy a bond, you know, we probably look at 50 bond desks, but if you go to another bond desk, you're not going to be able to see that. You're going to have to sell whatever they push down. And I think Wall Street has camouflaged their stockbrokers as all financial advisors and teams and wealth advisors and all of that when effectively they're controlled by those firms and then they can't do anything outside of what those firms sell. I don't care what they tell them. Okay. Um, and so they're all going to end up in exchange rated funds or indexes or whatever they want to call it because when the commission business went away and there was two or three reasons for it, but it went away, they had to do something differently, make money. So they, push themselves over in the managed money business. Um, and that, that, that can be toxic for people too, because they're not going to get a real good look at it. Oh, that's on the stock and bond side. And then on the other side, and this is where I think they've really, really, in my opinion, uh, been a real disservice to individuals is when you get into alternative investments and most average investors have no way of knowing, what's in a private real, private equity real estate deal, private equity business deals. They have a, you know, they, cause they put it in a fund. The fund is chock full of fees inside out, coming in, going out. You can't get liquidity. And uh, that's one of the ways they've made a lot of money on that. You know, if you open those up today, you know, they've got, and they've done put funds together. They're doing private lending to, you know, companies. Uh, that's one of their new new big fields. But when you get into it, you know, a lot of that's not doing really well, but nobody's going to tell you. That's the problem. <laughs> They'll never tell you uh, because it's got to be raw roses. And so the, what I always tell everybody is, hey, look, you're in charge of your own destiny. And so if you invest in something and you can't get really good, I mean, detailed information about it, then you probably shouldn't invest in it. And you're never going to get that with one of the big funds because they don't want you to have it. 
if I go out here and buy an apartment complex or invest in a building, I know exactly what I own. Okay. And I, I can see it. I know what the details are. I know the good, bad, and different. Um, you're never going to know that with alternative investments out of wall street. Cause they're just not, they will, they will not help you at all. And, you know, I've watched wall street for four decades and they've always got something new. They're selling you. I could go back through the whole list and uh, they usually come late in the game and they ruin whatever investment they decide to go into because they overcapitalize it. I've seen it from drilling rigs back in the eighties to, you know, the computer leasing systems, you name it, you know, up to dot com and, 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 and everything. And now you've gone through all the SPACs. So you, I could just take you down the list here and it's uh, it's unfortunate, but, um, but the, and, you know, the retail advisor, they're the retail person is when it gets a hit on it. So hopefully I didn't talk too long on that, but that's my point on it. No, I think that's a great analysis there. I think there's an old book too, similar to yours, talking about how, why the clients of the stockbrokers don't own yachts. <laughs> well, that is a book. It says, where are the customer's yachts? I have the book, where are the customer's yachts? That's a long time ago. That was, I'm going to say that was in the seventies. Uh, I may be wrong, but I think that's when the book came out. I've got a copy of my library, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a true, real book. <laughs> Well, my grandmother was actually one of those victims uh, before she passed away and my grandfather died before her. She got stuck with a stockbroker. She didn't have a financial education. She was like one of those widows and orphans that when I was working as a stockbroker, that the people in the sales meetings and marketing departments were telling us to target. And she didn't have a financial education and in inherited a sizable amount of wealth from my grandfather. And she got stuck with mortgage backed securities and bad real estate investment trusts right before the 2008 financial crisis. And then she passed away shortly after the crisis started. So it's, it's uh, a example of my family directly getting hit by wall street sucker jobs. But I want to talk about some of the, some of the lies though, specifically, I mean, Goldman Sachs has come out and said recently that there's what only a 10 or 15% recession risk. Janet Yellen has said that uh, she's a treasury secretary that two wars can easily be funded. These are absolutely ridiculous lies. Don't you think? Well, for sure. I think one of the problems you get into with wall street banks is just that they're on wall street. Um, and they have very little knowledge, at least I'm talking about firsthand knowledge of what goes on, on, on main street or with the average person. I think I'm fortunate in this that I've lived uh, all three socioeconomic levels. And so I can, act, I can talk to somebody at the very low end and I know what they're talking about and the middle class and the upper class. And, but what happens is they, they basically, um, they basically are in their own club. And so, yeah, you know, for them, uh, they wouldn't think that anything wrong is wrong with the economy because, they're in the, what I call the wall street club. So they can't, you know, it's, it's, it's all part of that system. You know, it's, you know, it's wall street, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and the, they go to the same places, do the same things. And so that's well, all you see. It's all, you know, you know, well, as long as asset prices don't crash for too long, right. They're still making money off the fees. Like you said, because now, now for really since index funds and they're not making the commissions off people stock trading, like they used to in the past because people are index funding or other types. It seems that they're mostly collecting um, fees off of asset management, but as long as asset prices uh, stay relatively high, they're still making good incomes. Well, that's true. Uh, you know, and again, uh, you know, I, I just, I just see all this. And if you look, there's some books, you know, a number of books that have started to come out now. Uh, Gretchen Mortensen wrote the book, the plunders. I mean, uh, I can't remember the name. It just came out. I read it. Uh, yeah, I, I interviewed know. her about it too. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good book. I'm sure it was a good interview with you. And, um, and then another book called The Plunders, really talking about various things about private equity. But the, the main point is that it, it's kind of the same, you know, it's the same, it's the same club really. And it's, uh, uh, it, it, they're, they're, they're in a cocoon. So they can't, they can't see what happens. As far as Jenny Yellen, I mean, she was a horrible, uh, she was a horrible Fed president, and we keep bringing these people in from academia who know nothing about what goes on. That's part one with the Federal Reserve. It's all academics. And we have, what, 350 PhDs and, you know, you, you, academics don't, I'm really familiar with academic, 
um, and I'm just telling you, they have most of them uh, have don't have a clue as to what's going on, you know, with uh, with you know with the re in the real world. I'll put it that way. Yeah, there. I think there's actually thousands of PhD economists at the Federal Reserve Bank at all the different locations earning over $100,000. A, a lot of them are also like hate capitalism, even though they're making six figure incomes and can't be fired. And a lot of them voted for Bernie Sanders. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, you can't. I mean, that's Jenny L is a perfect example. Just look at her history. OK, she's always worked for non business. Now, you know, I always say this, if I listen to some, I always want to listen to somebody that's had to meet payroll had to worry about borrowing money, keep your business going, had to do the things that happen day to day. I don't need to talk to somebody that dreamed it up uh, in a classroom and decided that's the way it ought to be because it never works. And uh, and I, I guess I'm a cynic in that respect because I've just seen too many of them that don't work. So I want to ask you now about a bond bear market and deflation. It, I, I know you were managing money in the 1970s is this the longest bond bear market that you can remember with the Fed rate hikes? Well, actually, no, it isn't. Uh, the 70s, from from the time that Arthur Burns was there, and I I, I came out of the business in 75. So when from the time that Arthur Burns was there in 70, uh, it was up and down, up and down, up and down. Now, I would say this, this has been a faster move than those were, but not a longer move. And what they kept doing then was making the wrong mistakes. They would think they had it under control. They would loosen. Here it come again. They would tighten, then they'd have to loosen. And that went on until finally Volcker said, hey, enough of that. We're going to, you know, finish this thing. And it it went on, you know, quite a while. And you, you went through a period there where, uh, I mean, I learned to work through it, even as a young guy. Uh, you just had to buy maturities that were short because you, if, if you're, if you made an error and you were too long, you couldn't wait on those to come due. So you had to have everything, you know, less than 48 or six or 60 months. And I actually did a study in the eighties, um, around, I guess 86, 87, when I looked at how much of the yield curve we would have gotten had we just kept everything less than 60 months. And I think I remember we would have gotten 85 or 86 percent of the yield curve over time. And so my thought was, well, why would I risk, you know, capital in a big way for that 30 year paper or 25 year paper when I could get a lot of it? Let's see, it was 80 percent even of the yield curve. But that's what happened. That was a longer time. It, it, this one was, was stronger, but shorter so far, but not as long as that one. Do you think these banks, and it might not just be U.S. banks, because the U.S. banks, and we talked about this last time you were on about the BTFP, the bank term funding program, which is the shadow liquidity program that the Fed mm -hmm. set up to protect some of the regional banks and some of the other banks. Do you think the foreign banks, so like banks in Canada, Japan, European Union, are they going to have massive losses from these longer duration treasuries that they bought for liquidity then if this bond bear market continues? Well, here's the problem. Let's say you stay and rates, you know, do, I think people forget that rates do come and go. And I know right now they don't feel like they'll, they'll, they'll go down, but they, they go up and down and they're always going to go up and down. But one of the problems for the bank right now is I think they thought, you know, a year ago, we'll be out of this pretty soon and, you know, get back to normal. Well, what happened is it got worse since July. You know, the long bonds gone up, you know, 25% more since basically since July. And I think that's what's thrown them for sure. What scares them is this. If you look at most banks, uh, say private and to a degree public, but most banks look at it this way. If, if their bond portfolio is really down on them and, and it's, if they own bonds, they're down. Now that they don't, you know, if they own just one year stuff, that's one thing, but, but you know, you can, you can look on a call report and know what they own, but, uh, if, if you look at them, you know, they're, you're going to, you're going to show, you know, that they're down and it, what they worry about is if they lose any more on the deposit side, it, 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 that's what can get them in trouble. Um, if they, if they, if they can't hold deposits and they've done a pretty good job of it, I will say so far, but if for some reason they get a 
pretty big move on deposits out of the banks, then that's when they're in trouble because if that happens to them, they're going to have to, they may not take all the losses, but they'll take in. And the problem about those losses, Jason, is that they, it goes straight out of capital. So it's not like, you know, they can't, they, you know, they can't take, they can't take much of that. And so what I watch all the time right now, not so much the bonds because they have, you know, most banks are not going to mark them to don't, don't have to mark most of the paper mark to market, which I don't know. Uh, I think they would bust the system if they had to, but, um, but anyway, anyway, what happens from that standpoint is that you have to watch where they're going on deposits. Deposits leave, then you need to start worrying about the banks. Yeah, so the retail investor has been pulling deposits. That started what around Silicon Valley Bank because they're getting the short-term U.S. Treasury yields. They're going to Treasury Direct or they're going to money market funds. So you think that that will continue then as long as the Fed keeps rates higher for longer? Well, they, they keep having alternatives. You know, uh, if you look, if you look at, uh, I'll give you a good example. Now we don't, we own direct treasury, so we don't own exchange traded funds in most cases, unless it's, we're trying to trade something. But normally, um, like if you look, we own direct treasuries, but you look at some, I'll give you an example, some things that I don't remember being around two or three years ago were like TFLO, which is a real short term floating rate. It's called the floating rate treasuries or TBIL you know, the, 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 the treasury bill ETF and that sort of, well, people have a, they have a place to go now. I mean, they can easily buy that stuff, you know, without, without having to even talk to anybody uh, and get over 5%. So, yeah, they're, they're looking at it closely. And I think they're, they're saying to themselves, you know, I, I'm, I'm just not going to keep as much money in the bank. Why should I? Yeah, so regional banks are getting hurt worse. I think JP Morgan, so the larger too big to fail banks, they're still getting a lot of depositor funds and they're not paying any type of interest really. But that's only what, with the five or six large banks like uh, Jamie Dimon and JP Morgan, some of the others. Well, people have to realize on those situations, if I'm if if I'm a if I'm a big borrower, I mean I'm borrowing big money, okay. Uh, one of the ways that I get to adjust my interest rate is by having a lot of money on deposit that might not pay me as much, but I, but, but I pick it up on the other side by not paying as much on the interest side. So, you know, that, that's a sort of tip for tech kind of deal uh, that you see quite a bit and then not surprising to me. And a lot of people are saying, well, you know, I'd rather have the safety of the too big to fail bank. So I don't mind. I'll keep some money there and just let it hang. Uh, not, not really the best thing to do, but uh, I think that's what goes through the mindset. So you think then on a relative basis, U.S. banks, even the regional banks, despite maybe a lot of their loan book with small business loans, commercial real estate, the Fed has more liquidity and shadow liquidity backstop set up. Whereas if you're a foreign bank, you have the dollar rallying, you have a lot of dollar denominated debt, and then your currency is getting weak against the dollar. The dollar index is is relatively strong right now. And then all these treasury bonds you own, if you're a foreign bank, say in Canada, your currency is getting killed against the dollar. And then you have to you have uh, losses on treasury bonds. So it seems like maybe the foreign banks have a lot more problems right now on a relative basis than U.S. banks. I would say so. Um, you know, it, you know, I don't know. I, since I don't own a lot of those, I don't know what you know what the leverages are. But I'd have to agree with you on that, that uh, they, they sort of have a double whammy. In that, uh, you know, if, if you look at what they own and where their money is, um, they're sort of getting hit from both sides. And another thing, you have to look at it this way on those banks. A lot of those areas, just say, take Europe, for example, um, you know, most of it is in recession, hard recession, you know. And so uh, that that's what happens. Um, you know, that's what happens there. Uh, and so they sort of get it from two or three sides right now. Well, also the majority of collateral in the global financial system and the global banking system is U.S. Treasury bonds. And look at the yields on what the 10 year and a lot of the Treasury bond yields, they've surprisingly kept rallying, even though the Fed says they're not going to be they're taking a break from raising rates, at least. Yeah, well, uh, and. Uh, I know I think the bond market said to the Fed, look, we don't believe you. So when he passed this last time, I think the bond market said, hey, we, we don't believe you. Um, 
and and that's that's why that all came about like that. Oh, you don't think then that that there's a supply demand mismatch then in the U.S. Treasury market that uh, the market's calling out uh, D.C.'s reckless spending, and then there's uh, too much D.C.'s issuing too much supply with the budget deficits, and the demand for U.S. Treasuries is not matching supply. Well, I think that's part of it, but what happens is you get what happens is you get more supply when people say. Hey, I don't believe these people. So I'm going to sell even sell more bonds in addition to what the government's selling. I mean, they sold bonds today. So yeah, you've got both of those working at the same time. And it's really interesting. Um, if you look at this 33 trillion we have, and by the way, I've watched it since we didn't have a trillion. <laughs> now we have 33 trillion uh, that's, that's, that's borrowed. And if you just look at how quickly that number has moved up and is moving up, it actually, I, I wish I had knowledge of what to do about that, but but I don't know what's going to really happen with it. Uh, I just know it's extremely high, and we, um, you know, we 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 don't get, we don't seem to have anybody thinking about it. <laughs> so that's my problem with it. Um, and if you look at uh, sort of the, the the way the numbers move, you know, they just they're quick they're quick moving numbers right now. It's a problem, and uh, you know, hard to say, but uh, that's kind of where that's where we are. You know? Well, it's a math problem, and DC doesn't really seem interested in cutting spending. I mean, both political parties. I think that's one of the reasons why the House Speaker was kicked out was because a lot of stuff, extra spending trillions in extra, was snuck into the Inflation Reduction Act. About seventy percent of the Green New Deal was snuck into the legislation there for trillions extra in spending. So both political parties are to blame here for this mess. And now here we are with interest rates at these levels, the interest payments on the debt. So this is what a lot of people have been warning about for many years. Interest payments on the debt were very, very low. So the government could handle uh, running those budget deficits and not really have to worry about interest payments on the debt. But I think what we're looking at around $1.3 trillion uh, by the end of next year in 2024 per year in interest payments on the national debt if D.C. keeps spending at these levels. Well, that's true. I mean, if you look at just, you know, that part of the debt alone, I, mean, I pull it once in a while just to look and see where it is, but it's, 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 it's big. And if you, if you relate it down to what would that be per individual, you know, at per taxpayer, just that 33 trillion, it's about 260 grand. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, well yeah, the, the average American doesn't have anything close to that. I mean, like most Americans like have around six thousand dollars in credit card debt now, like the stuff for we we have. a I would say we have a bifurcated economy right now. So if someone has sure. over five hundred thousand dollar a year of income, a lot of assets, not a lot of high interest debt, they're in OK to good shape. Pretty much everyone else is is dealing with stagflation, shrinkflation taxes and then trying to um, maintain their standard of living in a very difficult environment with high interest. Well, that's true. And I, I mean, even debt per citizen, you know, 300 and whatever, 35 million people or whatever is a hundred grand almost just per citizen. <laughs> that's for everybody. So we, yeah, it's, uh, that, that is, uh, that's a mess. I, I wish I, I wish I knew the answer to that. And the only answer I can come up with is that it's going to be such a crowd out mentality going forward that, you, you probably will never see GDP back up at five or six percent again. So by crowding out, do you mean that the government's spending? So like the Federal Reserve Bank and the Treasury are going to make sure that D.C. spending is taken care of and it's going to hurt what small businesses and mainstream people then? Yeah. And also the fact that if you look at the money that goes to the government, so much of it is going to be spent on uh, on interest and debt that it can't go back into any you know, any, any programs. If you, I mean, if you look at just, um, and that's not counting social security, Medicare and unfunded liabilities, which are huge, uh, even bigger than that, you know, that, that, that group's really big too. So you have it coming from every side. And I guess what I'm saying is you just, they just don't have enough money to really, uh, do anything else other than try to fund, you know, fund those programs and defense. And then, um, and that's about it. And that's, you know, unfortunately, all our money goes toward those things. But that's what I mean by that. You probably when you have 
when you have that sort of setup, you just never get to a point to where you should be operating. I mean, I, my friend Lacey Hunt, uh, I talk to once in a while. Lacey, yeah, if you go back and look for every dollar they borrow now, they get, I don't know, 23, 24 cents back from it. I mean, it's, it's a joke, but, uh, but that's where are we are. Are you talking about like positive GDP spending? Well, I'm thinking about, you know, if you look at, if you look at the four components of GDP and, and obviously governance one of, one of the things you get into there is um, what are they doing that would, that would be positive for the economy? Well, all they've been doing is borrowing money. They haven't done anything. If you look at all the programs they put out since 2018, the last five years, they've, they've done nothing to really, you know, create positive moves by business and make you want to do things. They're just money. They give away money. Um, in the end, that won't, that won't work because you're not really, you're not really pushing investment. So I, I think that's where we are, but again, I don't, I don't have an answer for it. Yeah. I think it's just a math problem at this point, but I think the government really, cause the U S government is the world's largest debtor now with the amount of debt. Uh, I don't think they, that they can allow deflation for a long period of time. Now, you've, you've been involved in many more cycles than I have, and I know you've also studied financial history. So do you think at this point with the debt situation, government finances, tax receipts are starting to fall, can the government actually allow deflation for a long period of time? No, they really can't because then you get in, you get in real trouble. Now, inflation, yeah, they could, they could allow it because it would help them. Uh, but deflation, no, that, that would, that, that, that would really, that would throw us into some, something pretty dire, I think. So I, I, that, that, that would be no. <laughs> well, we're already starting to see the tax receipts for the government collapse right in the real economy. So, and that's not yeah. even counting asset prices. If asset prices start to fall. Nope. That's true. If you look at, if you look at state and local tax receipts, <laughs> I've got a graph that shows it. Uh, that we'll be using this week, matter of fact, and they're they're down. Not so a good then, setup. So if tax receipts continue down, do you think then the the Federal Reserve Bank's gonna have to do a 180 on its balance sheet? Who's gonna fund the the budget deficits then if um people if foreigners, so Japan, Germany, and China aren't buying as many treasuries? Who's gonna fund government then? <laughs> well you'll be back in that thing really you're going to be back in that situation where, you know, there's only one way to do it and that is to print it. And that would be disastrous, but, but that's where we are. But we, you know, we brought it on ourselves. We kept, um, you know, kicking the can down the road. Nobody wants to do anything positive. And so, and both parties, by the way, um, nobody thinks about it. And, and I think that, that I think it's, it, the whole thing is so messed up that, uh, you know, it's just, a it's something that one of these days and you'll get to a point to where you can't, they can't really, it, the numbers don't work. And when that happens, you know, we'll be more like, I won't say we'll be South America because we're too large, but we'll be in a situation that we're probably, um, you know, we're, we're, we won't be able to really have what I consider the up and down normal economic times and that sort of thing and really do well with it. But and I'm not trying to be too, too, mess, too pessimistic about it. It's just that, that we, we haven't been in this situation before. Well, we have actually, we, we, if you look at debt, debt to GDP back in, uh, you know, back in the thirties, of course it took a long time to work that off. And then the same way in World War II, it was like that. Uh, and really, if you look at it in both cases, it took a long time, but you had to sort of inflate your way out of it. And that's the only way you got there. I want to transition now and ask you about real estate, since I know you're also a real estate investor and that you're an investor in regional banks in Dallas area and other areas. With interest rates at these levels, do you think that real estate, especially residential real estate, uh, we've talked about commercial real estate. Do you think commercial real estate will get worse? And do you think that residential real estate home prices will start to break too? Well, I'm going to take uh, commercial first. And, you know, I'm in Austin and, uh, of course, it was one of the hottest markets, but uh, I, w I just have to tell you what I'm seeing now. I'm, I've, 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 I've long known that a lot of the people in real estate, uh, their floating debt would floating debt would catch up with them, or they were either too leveraged, or they were too leveraged with with floating debt. 
And now what I'm starting to see, uh, and it's really picked up the last two months, is where I'm, I'm seeing people say, hey, um, that investment you had in something uh, didn't make it. And so that, that and these are big, big groups, okay, that have, and that one's, that one's not going to make it. That's a zero. And we're going to give the keys back to the insurance company or the bank. And I'm starting to see more and more, and I've seen like six of these in the last six or seven weeks where they are big deals and they're big so office are, buildings. So are the, these are office buildings? What what exactly types of buildings are these? They're most they're mostly office buildings. Now, um, the trouble you're getting to on the other side on multifamily is different. Um, most of those have floating debt, so they're having to go back to investors. I'm seeing a lot of this too, a lot, uh, where they're having to do a cash call because they had a finance wrong. And a lot of them are buying and, you know, it was really hot at the time. So, uh, you know, we've always been really conservative in what we looked at in real estate, but uh, they would go out and, and not, not have the financing right. And they buy, the other thing they do is they buy BNC properties um, just with a big hope and betting on the come that they could, you know, uh, turn it in two or three or four. We had this whole group of what I call flippers. They would buy these things. And it was, it was the right, it was the right time for it. You know, you could own it two or three years, two, two and a half years, sell it, make a 18% ROI and people thought, man, this is the best thing going. So they, but the problem was they, they stayed with it too long. And so now they've ended up with properties where they've got floating debt and are having to go back and recap and go back to investors because we're seeing it, a lot of cash calls right now. So, That's so the are, are cash stuff. calls where they have to put more uh, cash to re uh, put more equity back into the deal or they're going to have what they're going to have a default on the mortgage? No, it's a situation. Well, here's the way most of them go. They say, look, you're going to need to put more cash in or you're you're going to you're going to still have your investment. But it's going to be diluted because we've got to raise some more cash from somebody. Now, I think they'd have problem raising it. The ones that most of the ones I see where they're doing the cash calls, they're saying, OK, on that cash that you put into the deal. And here's why, you know, they're in trouble. They say we're going to pay you 11, 12, 13, I've said somewhere in the last week, 14 and a half percent. So I know that they're not doing well or you wouldn't have to pay that for that money. And they're trying to entice those investors to bring that cash on the cash call. Um, and I think there'll be a lot more of that. I think we're just. We just started it and the same way in commercial real estate. Uh, there's so, if you look at, and it's interesting to me, you watch commercial real estate brokers, you know, um, they usually will, most of the time they won't tell you that things are bad, you know, cause they kind of like wall street, they don't want you to know. And so they won't really tell you, but some will, you know, you'll, you'll really find out about what's happening. And, and people forget that most, most uh, most commercial people in the commercial leasing and brokerage business, not all of them, but most of them, as far as I know, are, in, are still contract employees. So they need to be selling something or leasing something to make this whole thing work. And it's just slowed down a lot. And a lot of a lot of footage coming on. I mean, there's a Wall Street Journal article uh, two weeks ago, I think two weeks ago, Friday, about the, the big four Texas cities. And we're not unlike all these other places the same. And that is, uh, they've got average 25% vacancy rate in the downtowns, Austin, Dallas, and Houston. And so uh, it's just starting, but this is this is probably going to be a long, drawn-out deal. And I think that, should, that part of it is just starting. That's why we always tell everybody, hey, you need to keep liquidity because, number one, you need it. And secondly, you could, you could probably really find some stuff that's going to work right for you in the next couple of years. Yeah, I don't think there's been a commercial real estate bear market for decades. I think the last one was at least three or four decades ago when like Donald Trump and Sam Zell and Sheldon Adelson and Steve Wynn, some of the casino guys started having busts what in the 80s yeah. or the early, early 90s, I think. Well, I will tell you in the 80s, from say 80, 85 on, and one of the things that happened is, is Ronald Reagan changed the depreciation rules. Before that, you could buy a deal, and if you just got the if you just got that part of it as a tax benefit, you really didn't even have to have cash flow. But he flipped it on them, 
and changed the depreciation rules. And so that a lot of, and then that started it. And then all of a sudden in the eighties, uh, you know, economy's not doing all great. And then, and that was, I can't tell you how many deals I saw bad in the eighties. I mean, it was, um, well, rates were still pretty high, right? Volcker hadn't started and then Alan Greenspan took over. They hadn't started rapidly lowering interest rates yet. Yeah. They had started down and a lot of people did things. Uh, all your, all your somewhat older viewers remember this word, which is join several. And on all these deals that you put, you know, I, I met lots of friends of mine that have, you know, six, seven people on a building, office building on a real, or on a couple of apartments or whatever. And times were so bad that half of them couldn't make the payments. The other half had, they were, the banks went to them. And so, um, and that's, I think that's another thing with banks right now. I think they've done a lot of non-recourse financing. Uh, so they can't go back on the people that have done it. I've really criticized banks for that because they were trying, they were so competitive. They had to take that off of it, but, uh, the banks will end up with some property. They've already ended up with some property. Well, the, the other big bubble and bust that we're seeing now is Airbnb because that was because of what, um, all the people going on vacation, uh, prior to the pandemic and during the pandemic, some people want to go on vacation, but you had fed zero interest rate policy still for a number of years. And so people were what borrowing for Airbnbs for rental for cash flow. But now with these interest rates, I mean, there's uh, this is looking like an absolutely enormous bust. Oh yeah. You know, and if, I think the thing about that, um, uh, you, you know, I think the, the thing about that was, it was easy for an individual to get into to say, Hey, I'm going to buy a, a couple of houses and I'm just, I'm going to get this area. And, and I think that's, that's what caught them, you know, and then all of a sudden they're realizing, Hey, that, uh, that's not working here. And there's one other thing, two other things on that, uh, we'll say Jason, one is that since real estate went way up, municipalities and counties felt like they could they really raise the taxes on you so that caught them one thing and then secondly and this has happened a lot the last two years their insurance went nuts and so between those two things couldn't make the numbers work on it you know well they're also raising the cost so if you're trying to rent an airbnb now i mean there's like a pandemic cleaning fee and the cost is no longer way cheaper than going to a hotel and you get a lot more amenities and benefits going at a hotel you get a breakfast and you know the maid comes in and cleans things i mean there's not a 200 dollars pandemic cleaning fee or 150 dollars that's added so the price is no longer competitive airbnb years ago used to be way way cheaper than yeah. going to a hotel totally um it's no it's not that's like so many things that pop up sometimes and become a fad uh you have to be careful because a lot of them don't work and that's one that's having a hard time right now so this environment seems really difficult. A lot of volatility. It's re relying on the Fed. I mean, if the Fed keeps rates at these levels, I think there's going to be what some type of real estate bust with worse commercial real estate, like you said, uh, worse Airbnb bust, maybe even multifamily and other problems if Fed keeps interest rates at these levels, uh, foreign banks uh, bust here, depending upon what the Fed does with rates. Do you think then that uh, buy and hold is going to be very, very, for any type of asset class is going to be very difficult in this environment? Well, I do. I just gave a speech uh, last Thursday. And one of the things I mentioned was that uh, you're going to, I really feel like this decade and so far that's proven out that this decade would be a decade where, you know, you're probably going to have four to 6% returns in stocks, which is going to really throw off a lot of people of all these people that have come into the industry and invested since 2009. They're not going to be used to that. And uh, I think, the buy and hold part of it is what's been trained up the last 14 years or so. And that group of people are going to have a really hard time adjusting to up and down, up and down, up and down from 1966 to 1983. For example, part of the time I was in business, uh, the markets went zero, didn't go anywhere. They were exactly the same at that end of that period. If you looked at General Motors and Sears and Polar, all of those hot stocks, they never went up uh, during that period. They were exactly the same. Same thing January 2000 to about 2011 or 12. You're talking about the S&P making one point. But see, 
since that 09 period, you've had, I don't know, over 40% of the people came into my business. All right. And that's all they know. And I've said all along, we'll go from a 60, 40, you know, wall street love of, you know, 60% stock, 40% bonds to more like a, a spread of just a small amount in stocks, maybe 30. And then you're going to have a lot of short term paper, you know, less than four or five years. And then you'll have a lot of cash and you're going to have to know when to deploy it and when to take it off if you plan on making any money. And I think that's where we are in the business right now. Well, the problem with modern portfolio theory and that 60 40 rule, and that varies depending upon someone's age, is there's no diversification there for commodities, for energy. Right. I mean, we were talking before we started recording. I think there's a lack of investment on the supply side for all of these non ESG energy plays. I think there's a lot of good opportunities there, depending upon the time you buy it and the price that you're buying in. I think there's a lot of long term investment opportunities there. But Wall Street doesn't want to sell anything because uh, they were what kissing, kissing <coughs> the government's butt for ESG. Uh, they were promoting ESG and carbon <coughs> credits and stuff for years. Yeah. And I mean, that whole that the, the whole ESG thing was, it was, it was just a big narrative. I mean, I think people don't realize when, and, they, and nobody is, you know, I, I've had commodity accounts for years with two or three different really good people. And so I, I, I know that business. Okay. But I think we are coming back in and interesting. You mentioned that to a commodity cycle where, uh, where you'll have to have some exposure to commodities. And uh, again, every, most of the people in the business today and most of the investors don't have any exposure to com the commodity side of the business. Um, but I do think it's something that's going to come back into play. Yeah, I would agree. I think a diversified portfolio, I mean, the modern portfolio theory says just regular stocks and bonds or an index fund, maybe some dividend stocks, consumer staples. I mean, you're not buying any of the stuff that the emerging market. So, India, China, other emerging markets. I mean, they're consuming more calories. They're consuming more energy. These are long, pow very powerful long-term trends. Yeah, and I, 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 I just think the average person's not thinking about that, and they never have had to, uh, you know, experience it. So that's part of what, uh, you know, that's part of what goes on. But you know, you, you, you'll, you'll see. But I. I know they're not thinking that way, but I, we, we really been looking at this really hard that we'll certainly look at uh, the commodity side of the business for the next 10 years. So last question before I let you go, I know you've been through many different cycles and studied financial history. Have you ever seen asset markets this reliant on Federal Reserve policy before? No, I, I will tell you, uh, Jason, I've, I've said this before. I think we've had 20 years of an incredibly irresponsible Federal Reserve uh, that forgot about what their mission was. Their mission was not to support the stock market. And it started really with Greenspan. And but it all every every person after that got even worse about thinking that their whole thing was to make sure the economy was OK and the stock market was OK, not the, you know, Heretofore, 40 years ago, it was the other side around. You know, what happened is you, if the economy did well, the market did well, and now we they tried to flip it. So I think they've been terribly irresponsible uh, as a group. I don't think you could have believed anything they told you the last 20 years, because most of them usually didn't come true. Uh, and I think they're the same way today. I think we have a a group of people that don't really have a clue about what's happening. And so I, I don't put much credence in, in trying to follow the Fed or anything, because they'll, they'll turn on you in a, in a, in a, in a second. And so, um, well, yeah. I, I think they've dislocated things tremendously between the real economy and asset prices. Now, I don't think I, we've ever seen things this dislocated between the real economy and asset prices before. hundred percent. And, uh, they, you know, I, I'm, I feel for the middle class because we don't have much of one now and they've really they've made the wealthy the wealthy people wealthier and made the poor people poorer. And I, I think I think they've done a tremendous injustice to this country with the Federal Reserve policies the last 20, 25 years. Yeah, but DC loves it because DC's been DC's been getting rich or getting richer. 
And then DC is taking even more tax receipts for capital gains taxes on stocks, bonds, real estate. And same, like you said earlier, for the states and munici municipalities for these uh, property taxes. I mean, these property taxes are up a lot in the last 10, 15, 20 years. Oh, unbelievable. And you know, what should happen is when you have better economic times, if you were getting the right kind of fiscal policy out of Washington, then you would put money in the coffers in poor economic times, they would then do fiscal policy that would get some things going to like, you know, it, they never use the right sort of things. If I'm an independent business person and you tell me that, hey, I'll give you a tax credit if you, if you, you know, if you raise some of your employees past a certain level of income or hire a new employee, and there's a lot of things they could do, but they quit doing that and they depended totally on the Federal Reserve, which is not smart. And so here's the Federal Reserve having to carry the water for the economy and then the stock market and all that sort of thing. And eventually, it comes around like now to where they can't do it. Uh, Keynes actually wrote about this initially. So his theory actually stated that his policy should be implemented with counter cyclical policy, but no one's actually implemented that way. The government never keeps a large budget surplus to spend in a recession or depression. It's crazy. They borrow, <laughs> you know, when times are good, they borrow a lot of money. When times are bad, they borrow a lot of money. So, you know, uh, again, uh, it, it's unfortunate, but uh, but we don't have much help in that regard. Well, Ted, I really enjoyed our discussion today. I think my listeners are going to get a lot out of this about the real estate market. Uh, I think people should uh, cash as king right now so, or short term treasuries or money market funds and just be patient and wait for opportunities, because I think there's going to be some really good opportunities if the Fed keeps making mistakes. Well, Jason, I agree with you. I, it's been a long time since you could get five and a half percent for 90 days. And I, I, I think people need to keep that in mind uh, that 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 may be for the next few years, that may be pretty good return. <laughs> and if you're in a state that has state income tax, you don't pay that. So uh, there's some plus, pluses to it. If my listeners want to check out Oxbow Resources or check out your YouTube channel, how do they do so? Uh, just go to uh, oxbowadvisors.com and it's the same way on, on YouTube, but under Oxbow Advisors. And, uh, you know, we've written a number of books. Our books are only about, you know, two hours, two and a half hours to read because we really try to get the point across. But, uh, and we've got a new book coming out actually next week. But, uh, but there's, they're all there. And if they, the care would be happy to send them one if they want to order one. They won't charge them after being on your show. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you again for your time, and I look forward to speaking to you again in a couple months. Okay. Thanks a lot, Jason.